Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This podcast is brought to you by hituni.com. HitUni are a provider of amazing online courses for high-intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co-author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer, founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and has supervised over 15,000 high-intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, and Dr. Ellington Darden, HitUni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high-intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website, where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high-intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention that there is a do-it-yourself DIY course. So this is a course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but want to learn more about high-intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regimen. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I.com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course, and enter the coupon code CW10. Thank you for your support. Howdy. What's up, guys? I am Lawrence Neal, and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior. And I am coming at you from Galway in Ireland. This podcast is my mission to understand how to better optimize productivity in health, career, business, and lifestyle. My guests include world record holders, medical physicians, health and fitness giants, high intensity training specialists, scientists, New York Times best selling authors, life hackers, extreme endurance adventure racers, and many more. My next guest is a board certified orthopedic surgeon, world record holder, a zero carb athlete, Dr. Sean Baker. Sean is one of my favorite people on the internet right now. I've been following him very closely on Twitter, bombarding him with questions about his very controversial zero carb diet, which basically means he just eats red meat with a little bit of seafood, some eggs and occasional cheese. He's been doing this for about seven months alongside an intensive exercise regimen that he's been doing for decades and has seen staggering results. Aside from feeling a lot better and having more energy, he's broken multiple world records in rowing, is dunking a basketball and deadlifting over 500 pounds for repetitions at 50 years old. Sean's background has seen him play rugby semi-professionally against the All Blacks, setting records and winning national championships in various weightlifting competitions, including deadlifting with a record lift of 772 pounds and winning championships in Strongest Man and Highland Games. He served in the US Air Force as a lieutenant colonel and was a nuclear weapons launch officer. What? I know we talk about that too. He then went on to train to be a surgeon and has operated for the US Air Force in the Middle East and locally in the US in a civilian capacity. More recently, he set multiple world records in rowing. He broke two of these records in the same day. And that is just scratching the surface. In summary, Sean is an incredibly interesting person, has a fascinating background and I was so excited to speak to him. If you hadn't guessed at 50 years old he's incredibly muscular and ripped standing at 6'5 and weighing 242 pounds. His Instagram videos are nothing less than impressive which show him training and competing. I deliberately do not focus on Sean's background too much because I think Paul Burgess over at the Athletic Fitness and Nutrition podcast already does a great job giving the context on Sean's background so I will link to that from the blog post. So in this episode, Sean and I cover Sean's experience working as a nuclear weapons launch officer, uh, his resistance training and skill training regimen and why he uses lots of plyometrics and other unorthodox approaches in his workouts. We talk about his zero carb diet, what he eats, when, how much, etc. We talk about how his diet has affected his health and improved exercise recovery. 
We talk about can you eat too many eggs? <laughs> what are we talk about the downsides of eating zero carb if there are any? I asked Sean, when was the last time he ate junk food and how does he navigate social situations and eating out? And we talk about much, much more. Sean and I are planning to do a longer part two to cover the ground that we didn't get to cover this time around and answer much more of your questions. For all of the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to 15minutecorporatewarrior.com forward slash podcast. That's 1515minutescorporatewarrior.com forward slash podcast. So without further ado, please enjoy this podcast with the Zero Carb Zealot, Dr. Sean Baker. Sean, welcome to Corporate Warrior. Appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. Um, as we were just talking about earlier, really excited to talk to you and been following you for a while. And you're one of the most interesting people on Twitter for me right now. Um, so as I said, before we, before we started, uh, recording officially, um, I will point all of the listeners to the, the interview that you did with Paul Burgess, um, for all of the stuff regarding your background, um, and a lot of your kind of, uh, I guess stuff you've done sort of, yeah, previous to now. Um, although I will dig into a little bit of that as we go on, but one of the things I wanted to ask you, and uh, which we briefly talked about just now is you mentioned when you were in the U S air force, you were a nuclear weapons launch officer, um, which right. is one of those, if you were to say that at a party, I'm sure you get a thousand questions. Can you just tell us what that was like and what an average day looked like in that type of role? Sure. So that there was a, there was a movie in the 1980s. I think it was called war games, which kind of depicts that kind of a, you know, a very dramatic uh, Hollywood uh, dramatic fashion, but that's basically the job I had basically. Um, so the, uh, you know, typically what we would do is you would spend, there would be two people and you would go down into this uh, nuclear launch weapons control center. And, you know, there was a bunch of uh, security guys up top. You take about a hundred foot elevator uh, ride down there. And then you spend 24 hours down there and you do that about, oh, I do, it was about eight times a month. Typically is what we would do that. And so the day would start, you know, you would you'd run some system checks and then there would be some uh, tests we would do that, you know, to kind of, prove we're ready for any, any kind of eventual launch of a nuclear weapon, which fortunately I never had to do, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was, it was an interesting job. I mean, it was, a, there was a lot of, uh, you know, your, your threshold for making mistakes was very, very well, basically zero. They had, uh, we would do tests very frequently where we would simulate going to war. And so if you made even the slightest spelling error, you know, you, you, you'd be, you'd be in, danger of losing your job basically so it was it was, a, it was an interesting uh, situation i did that for about five years in various capacities you know you start out um as a uh you know uh, it's kind of a regular crew guy that does that stuff then you go into instructor capacity and evaluator capacity so i did that over time i actually was one a uh as a crew commander of the year for, for the for the weapons group one year so it was a, it was a pretty interesting competition but it was just who could be you know, get through all these really crazy scenarios without making a mistake. You know, you would simulate your place was on fire. It's kind of probably like what pilots do, you know, very similar simulation processes. You know, they would, every worst possible scenario you would have to deal with. And then if you can get through that relatively flawless, you know, that was kind of what they were looking for. But yeah, so so about four, just under five years of uh, nuclear weapons stuff. So interesting stuff. I have a few questions on that. So how did you ever have like, moral issues doing that kind of role did they give you the opportunity not to do it well you know you know what you're obviously you know what you're doing when you go in and it's kind of interesting they, they do this uh well the u.s air force at the time they, they did a lot of personality testing and you had to you had to sort of pass these tests before they even let you do that there's a program called the prp program which stands for the personal reliability program and so you were you know, strictly uh, weren't allowed to take any kind of medications. If you took even a cold medication, you couldn't go to work. There were all these sort of psychological uh, uh, preventive measures to prevent anybody going down there that had any kind of uh, moral issues one way or the other. You might get some crazy guy who thinks he's going to try to launch one on his own, which which was pretty much impossible to do. But if you could co-opt a few other people, you might be able to do that. Uh, but but that, they had a lot of different, uh, you know, psychological uh things in place to prevent that stuff. But as far as moral issues, you know, um, 
I think if, if, if we ever went to nuclear war and I was a guy that, that, that did that, I would certainly have a lot of things to think about, you know, but, but then again, you have to think about why you're doing this stuff. It's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's the same thing we, we, we run into when I'm, when I'm in, when I'm uh, doing stuff in medicine, I had, I had to take care of a lot of people that were you know, death row inmates I had to operate on before I've operated on, you know, enemy combatants when I was, when I was in war. So you have to, you have to sort of put aside your moral and emotional, uh, misgivings and do the task at hand a lot of times. That's fascinating. I can't even begin to imagine like what that must be like, that experience having, you know, not, not just, I guess, a moral issue. Yeah. I mean, like you were saying, like, uh, you know, uh, doing surgery on, on uh, enemy combatants or, um, like people on death row that, yeah, it's just hard to even appreciate unless you've actually done it, which you, which you clearly have. Um, yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay, so I, I was fascinated about um, when, when you said that to, to Paul on his podcast. So I had to ask you. So you've got some fascinating um, exercise and dietary regimens that you follow. Um, and one of the first questions I ever asked you, and as you know, a lot of the listeners on this podcast are very into high intensity training or very passionate about, um, I guess, evidence based resistance training and doing exercise that is going to improve physical condition and not, I guess, damage it in any way. Um, and what the first question I asked you was, what do you think about high intensity training? I don't know if you remember me asking you that. And you said, and I, I can't find the exact tweet, but you said it's great for bodybuilding, but not so good for athletic and skill performance. Um, and some people advocate, you know, something like, body by science or a infrequently performed high intensity training regimen alongside exact skill practice. Uh, and and, it and they would, they would recommend that that is the, the formula for sporting success, um, genetics aside. So with that in mind, why is it that you, you seem to practice stuff in between that you seem to be quite, uh, involved in things like, uh, medicine ball throws and box jumps and sure. other various sure. sort of intense exercises that don't fit that kind of vanilla weight training formula so why do you do that and if you and how does that improve your your i guess your skills that you're focused on improving sure so i, I just think looking at my overall training philosophy you know I've i've had a background where i came from playing rugby, which, you know, you do a certain set of things to do rugby. And then I did a powerlifting, uh, fairly successful powerlifting career. And so that has its own different thing. And then I went into throwing, which when you, when you train like a thrower, there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a different training style that goes with that. And then now I'm doing this competitive rowing. So I've kind of hybridized all these different training philosophies to, to kind of get the results that, that, that work well for me. Um, you know, I think, Again, my goal is not bodybuilding. I know many people, you know, their goal is this body composition, bodybuilding. And I think the hit stuff certainly has a role there. And I do some of that. You know, like I said, when I'm in the gym, I'll do some stuff, you know, especially with the machine stuff. I think machines allow them allow that pretty well. I'm not I can't say that I've, uh, you know, spent a lot of time studying the stuff. I know I wore Mike Menser from years ago when I was, uh, you know, at, at 14 year old kid looking at bodybuilding magazines, I, you know, certainly Arthur Jones. I'm not, you know, I'm aware of some of his stuff, but, you know, for me, if you look at, you know, say Olympic athletes, you know, if you look at an Olympic athlete sprinter, he's not going to, he might do some hit component, but that's not going to be the whole focus of his training. And, you know, you can, you can almost extrapolate that to most, you know, high level athletes out there. I think the training frequency, if you look at, you know, your average, average Olympic athlete, they're not training once a week. I mean, that, I don't think anyone would propose that. And I don't think you can do it. So you, there's a lot of skill pr practice that you have to do. And one thing I think you find is as you get farther and farther advanced, that your frequency has to go up. some. you know, whether it goes from once a week to three times a week to, you know, if you want to look at like the, uh, say the Bulgarian weightlifting team from the 1980s. I mean, those guys are putting in, you know, 14 workouts a week sometimes. And so, and they, and you can't argue with the success they had. And so you have to, you have to sort of say, well, what gives you the most success in your experiment? Um, you know, the medicine ball stuff, the jumping, you know, I, as somebody who's getting older and I'm 50 years old now, I think one of the things we, we failed to address. I mean, we, we, we had a long time where everything was aerobics, you know, you would do, you know, jogging and aerobics was, 
in vogue for about 40 years. And then finally people snapped to, hey, we need to get stronger. And so now we've got people that are starting, you know, whatever strength training program is, whether it's HIT, whether it's uh, a more traditional powerlifting based program, which I think is a good trend. But I also I think people are lacking the development of, of the ability to, to jump, to run, to throw, to move and to keep those things going. I think we lose a lot of our uh, ability to do that as we age. I've seen some pretty strong older guys that, that maintain that pretty well, but I don't see too many of them that are that are, you know, doing plyometrics and uh, able to. I, I know your picture has you. Uh, playing basketball on your, on your thing. And I, you know, like I said, I don't play much anymore, but I can still get up and dunk a basketball, which I think is a pretty decent thing to be able to do at 50 years of age. And so I think most guys, even if they can squat four or 500 pounds or deadlift 500 pounds, aren't, aren't doing that because they just don't train those things. And I'm not sure, and maybe I'm wrong, I'm not sure that uh, hit by itself can accomplish that without adding those skills in there. And so you may be right. You need to, you need to practice those skills. And I think, uh, jumping, throwing, plyometric bite type stuff is, is, is important to incorporate, however, however you, whatever else you mix it with. Would it be fair for me to say then that you do it just for the sake of doing it because you want to be able to do it, so you keep doing it? Is that fair? Did I do... So the Sorry, because you, know, so um, you do obviously things like deadlifts and stuff like that, and you've got a very impressive deadlift. Um, right. But what I mean is the stuff that's more uh, non- I guess, um, weight lifting related. So like, you know, box jumps, medicine ball throws, sled sure. pulls, and um, so you do things like that. Is that more because you don't want to lose the capacity to do those types of skills, plyometrics, but dunking a basketball. It's not because you're doing it for some other outcome. Well, I think it's one, I want to maintain that capacity because I think it's important to maintain those, those, those abilities, uh, you know, at any age. And two, I think right now my, my primary focus is, is these, indoor rowing world records and i think for the sprint records those things are important i think you need to be able to develop force very quickly uh and and those support that now um once i'm done with that and i will be you know and maybe i get tired of breaking whatever world records i've broken I've already broken a whole bunch of them right now but once i get to where i think I, i've topped out i will probably transition on to a different sport and when I do that, I want to make sure I, I haven't let all these other things atrophy. And so I think it's important to continue to maintain your strength, your flexibility, your ability to move, uh, some, so, you know, some muscle size to maintain some muscle mass. And so I think all those things, the longer you can keep them, uh, the more opportunity you have later. So, I, you know, I'm just thinking about maybe I'll go back and do some track and field stuff, you know, in my in my mid 50s. You know, in my, and so I don't want to have to rebuild all that you know, type or type two muscle fiber and my capacity to, 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 to produce force very rapidly. I don't know if you've been watching or listening to much of Art Devaney's stuff recently, um, but he recently is, I think he's just turned 80 or turning 80. And he said that's middle age for him. So he's, I think he's keen sure. to live well over a hundred. And um, I wondered, do you, do you see yourself? I mean, he, he, he does a very, from what I understand, he does kind of daily resistance training, but negatives only. Um, so only the incentric okay. part, and he does it, but he does it every day. He doesn't go to failure though, um, but that's kind of his daily workout. Um, and he doesn't seem to do any other stuff from what I know. I could be wrong in terms of any other extracurricular sports or whatever. And I wondered, sure. do you see yourself doing these things, you know, in 10, 20 years time, do you think you will reduce that down or are you just sort of playing it by ear? Well, I mean, I have, since I've been about eight years old, I've been a competitive athlete and I've never stopped. And, and you know, it's kind of part of who I am. And so I anticipate that at 60, at 70, at 80, and hopefully God willing farther, I'll still be competing an athlete as an athlete and hopefully trying to break records. I mean, that's my goal. Uh, how that matches up to, to longevity and my health you know, we'll have to see my, my philosophy on that is I think you can certainly become a maintain good athletic ability and stay healthy. There's, there's, there's always, I see some people talking that you can't be a high performance athlete and, and it's, you know, and, and maintain health, which I think is, you know, I, I don't think that's true. I think there's people that, that, that's, that, that seem to think that, you know, by constantly pushing yourself hard, 
you're going to somehow burn out and, and end up sick. And I've not seen that in 50 years. I heard that when I was 20. Which way do you get to be 30? When I was 30, wait till you get to be 40. You know, now that I'm 50 and I'm still doing it, I'm just like, okay, well, I'm waiting for these things, these bad things to happen, and they haven't happened yet. And I think, I, I mean, I've been fairly intelligent about how I've approached training and avoiding injuries. And, uh, you know, as an orthopedic surgeon, I have pretty good knowledge of how the body works uh, and how to stay injury free for the most part. And I think diet, you know, as we may talk about, certainly I think plays a big role in that. But I think, you know, Artavena is great. I mean, I think, you know, he's showing that, uh, you know, you can be very healthy, very robust, and very vigorous at, you know, age 80, which is great. You know, if I look at my personal family, my, my grandfather was a, was a top level boxer and lived to 94 fairly robustly. My father's in his mid seventies and still very, very, uh, uh, good shape and fairly strong. And so, you know, hopefully I've got some good genes for that, but I mean, you know, more importantly, it's, you know, I think we've come to talk about health span now more than lifespan, you know, it doesn't do you any good to live to be 105. You spend the last 25 years, you know, in bed and and half demented, which I've taken care of too many of those people. And it's, it's a very sad, sad thing to see. We've, you know, we've successfully extended the lifespan for a lot of people, but we were, we haven't necessarily improved on health span, you know, with what I'm talking about uh, with modern medicine. So I had a question from a, a listener um, Twitter handle at Permsteader, and he asks, he'd love to hear your training schedule currently. So how many days you do high intensity training, interval training, sorry, or resistance training, and also the volume and intensity that you go to and how much recovery you give yourself? Sure. So... You know, like I said, right now my focus is on indoor rowing, and so um, I have a you know sort of a, a different sort of a thing I would do if I wasn't doing that. But right now, I, because my focus is on the rowing, I will typically s- start a workout with a with a pretty intense row. I'm usually I do I do a lot of time trialing. I try to I try to break either a world or national record about it three or four times a week. It seems like, and so I go in there. And these are 500 meter sprint, one meter sprint, one or 100 meter sprint, one minute sprints, or thousand meter sprints. So these are only about two, you know, uh, one minute to three minute efforts. So it's not that long, but it's 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 pretty hard. If you ever have you ever been on a, a concept two rowing machine and gone out? I have. Uh, yes, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, so they're they're they're, they're tough. You, you know, so I, I I would that's how I'll start. Now, having said that, I don't think that's the best way for me to train right now, but it's the best way for me to produce re- results on the rowing machine. But subsequent to that, I will then go to the gym, depending if I'm at home in New Mexico where I have a home gym, then, then it's right there. But if not, I have to drive to the, to the other gym in California. And then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, it'll be about a 20 minute gap between that. So I'll probably end up warming up again a little bit, maybe a light rowing or a rowing machine they have there. And then I'll, uh, maybe do a little jumping rope to warm because I know that the next thing I'm going to do is going to be, it's either plyometric or medicine ball based work. So I want to, I want to get used to moving a little quicker and then I'll spend about 15 minutes with some very high acceleration exercises, which are either med ball slams, plyometric jumps, you know, depth jumps, uh, uh, penta jumps where, you know, it's consecutive broad jumps, uh, things like that. I might uh, do some contrast training with that, where I might do some squat jumps superseded with, uh, you know, uh, some kind of jump or, or a med ball th- slow throw of some type, you know, I, I mix that up. And then after that, um, because I, I feel that if you put that stuff at the beginning of the workout, you're going to get, you're going to, it's going to work better than if you were uh, to follow us some strength training with that. So then after that, depending on what day I'm doing, if I'm going to deadlift or I'm going to do some other strength exercise, I'll go ahead and do that. If I'm not going to do that, or I might do what you might consider a, a more of a hip workout, I may go do some sort of bodybuilding type workout where I'll do a few sets or, you know, a couple, you know, drop sets to failure, you know, like a chest press machine, I might get on there and, and just do it until I fail, which I think would be more consistent with the hip type stuff. And then typically, depending on how I feel at the end, I might do a little bit of conditioning that might be uh, kettlebell swings, you know, I might do a couple hundred kettlebell swings. Uh, I may I may complex them with uh, med ball slams or jumping rope in the capacity to to get conditioned, or I might get back on the bike and do some sprints that way. So that's that's kind of how my workout would flow typically. So it starts out with the the jumping uh, plyometric stuff. I go into the strength training or the hypertrophy work, and then I finish with a little conditioning. And so that's what I would do. How often I would do that. 
oh, you know, depending on where I'm at and where my schedule allows, if I can do it four to five days a week, I'm pretty happy with that, you know. Uh, that's which is a lot more volume than, than, than you might normally see. Um, you know, I, what I look at is, you know, if I'm recovered enough to do it, I'll do it. And what usually tells me is the row the first thing in the morning. If I'm at my personal record or very close within a tenth of a second, then I'm fine. If I feel awful, you know, I, I might scale things back or I might might not even work out that day. It just depends. You know, I know a lot of people are into the heart rate vari- variability. I don't I don't do that right now, but I you know there's there's ways to test your preparedness for for uh, for workouts. I think besides that, you know, there's a lot of interpretation and a lot of stuff that we don't understand about heart rate vari- variability yet. So it's very it sounds very intuitive. So is that fair to is you see so you might go into a workout with the intention to do like things like plyometrics, um, stuff like that, followed by strength training, followed by conditioning. And but you but you're you won't have like a set routine, you'll just kind of do whatever you feel like doing. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean I kind of had loose goals in my mind. Like I say, I know this week so I want to deadlift, you know, like I'd like see very for what I'm doing currently. So la- I think last week I deadlifted 500 pounds for eight reps, you know, without a belt, you know, and I was, and my goal is 10. So this week I'll probably go in there and say I'm going to hit it for nine reps or maybe 10 reps if I feel particularly good and, and get that goal out of the way. Um, you know, I, there, there are, you know, each week I generally want to make sure I hit, you know, a few items and, and how they fall within the workout and how I feel. It, it, yeah. There is some intuition that goes with that for sure. Um, I, uh, you know, when you get to it, when you're at, when I'm at, when I'm at the gym at home, I can, you know, I don't have to wait on anybody until the equipment's available. And so, you know, that's one of the frustrations you have when you go to a, to a large commercial gym is that, uh, you know, Hey, I want to do that, but there's some guy there. And so you got to stand around or, or change what you're doing. And so that's, you know, obviously you've got to play it by ear a little bit in, 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 in those circumstances. But I, I generally, because I do the weird stuff that nobody else wants to do, you know, no one else wants to throw medicine balls into a wall as hard as they possibly can for 20 minutes. To, usually there's no one doing that. And so, or nobody wants to, you know, be jumping around. And so those things uh, I, I usually have free reign for, you know, and then uh, you know, if I want to do a machine, you know, there might be, might be a little bit of weight for that. So that's the only problem I, I, I encounter with that. I want to, um, cause so much want to ask you and it's a shame we haven't got like more, more time, but um what I want to do is pause on the exercise and ask you some stuff about diet because I'm just I'm I'm I'm, I'm uh, very excited about asking you some questions here. So I sent you a picture uh, quite recent. Of, I tweeted a picture at you of a bunch of sausages and yeah. cucumber, sure. <laughs> and and you said food plus decorations equals progress. Sure. Can you elaborate on sure. that? <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, obviously, if you follow me on Twitter, you understand that I'm, I'm basically I'm basically a carnivore at this point. You know, I've been going into my seventh month of eating just pure, basically a purely carnivorous diet, which is 95 percent meat, red meat, mostly a little bit of eggs, a little bit of fish. And so I haven't had a vegetable and probably even longer than that, probably 10, 10 months or so. And, and same thing with fruit. And so, you know, it's one of those things that when, when if you would ask me five years ago what I thought about that diet, I would say you're friggin' crazy. You know, I would say there's nobody that does that. And so, you know, as I as I kind of winded my way from, uh, you know, a more standard diet to a low calorie diet to to a finally a paleo paleo diet, and then then to a low carb diet, then to a ketogenic diet. And as I kept seeing my health get better and better, and my athletic performance getting better and better. You know, I just kept saying, well, let's see where this goes. And then, you know, I discovered some people doing this zero carb or basically pure carnivore diet. And they were, you know, just reading what they were saying, you know, even compared to a ketogenic diet, they were saying that, well, I just feel better and better and better, you know, and, and particularly uh, interesting to me was was aspects saying that their joint joints felt better and better, even compared to a ketogenic diet. And I still had a few minor sort of you know, as, as a 50 year old athlete, you have some minor aches and pains. And so I just said, I'm, I'm going to try this for a month. And I'd done it, you know, kind of for two weeks at a time here and there, kind of reading about, you know, the steak and egg diets back, you know, from the you know, 1950s with Vince Garand and stuff like that. So I'd, I'd been doing that already for about a year off and on. So I said, well, I'm going to do it for a whole month. And I felt really, really good. So when I got done, I said, well, I'm going to have, a, I had, I think I had a couple of strawberries and a little bit of, uh, 
peanut butter and some apples. And I was like, and I said, it just didn't make me feel very good. So I said, I'm going to go back to the steak thing. And I've been doing that consistently now for, you know, like I said, seven months. And at, at about the two month point, what I noticed was my strength really started to take off. My rowing performance, which I had already had the world record in, went up by another like seven to eight percent power production, which when you're already at a world record level is huge. And so, I mean, that to me is extremely remarkable. If you talk at any, you know, I'm 50. So, you know, you can take that with a grain of salt and say, well, it's an age age group record. But my numbers are, are equivalent to the guy that are the guys in their 20s and 30s. You know, I'm right in there with those guys. And so I'm, I'm still putting up uh, at least on the indoor rowing machine, world class numbers equivalent to guys 20, 30 years younger than me. And so that's pretty powerful motivation for me for saying that, that, you know, maybe this diet has a lot to do with it. And I haven't changed the way I've trained. So it's not like I suddenly changed my training style. So I have to attribute it at least somewhat to the diet. So that's been very interesting. How do you think um, your zero carb diet has affected your recovery? And do you think that you could train with the volume that you do um, if you weren't eating zero carb? Yeah, so I think it definitely has had an impact on my recovery. I think it's been a positive impact. And I'm not alone in this. I've talked to a lot of other people that are doing that. And they, they all know pretty much the same thing. And so uh, for me to, I mean, I've literally broken world records twice in the same day, you know, which is, you know, that's that, that speaks pretty much a lot of amount about the uh, capacity for recovery. If you look back into historical records of the, like the Inuit, uh, they were known remarkably for having tremendous work capacity. And, you know, that's, I don't think anybody really has sort of tested that athletically, but you know, I know for me, it's been pretty remarkable. Um, and the only reason I can train, you know, that frequently, uh, I think diet has to do with it. And I think a ketogenic diet does the same, you know, uh, the same thing but to a lesser degree. I think um, one of the problems with, high volume training when you're you know running basically carbohydrate based metabolism is you create a, a great deal more oxidative stress and i think that's harder to recover from and so i think that you know as we look at people that are you know not adapted to a diet for three weeks like most of the, the sports testing does but when you start looking at people that have done this for six months a year two years three years i think you find a, a much greater uh, recovery uh, capacity and i think that translates into long-term better performance you know i think i'm an example of that and so at least it, at least it needs to be tested you know i certainly may be wrong you know because we we don't have the data out there but i know my particular experience and i'm i'm pretty meticulous about uh, my training i recorded i've got everything every workout i've done for the last six or seven years recorded so i can kind of see where i was and where, I, where i've come from and right now you know Looking at where I was, I'm 50 now. So looking at where where I was at about 42, I'm, I'm about there. I'm getting right in that level. So I'm, you know, I, I was going down at, in my mid 40s, and so now once I hit 50, now I'm, I'm knocked about eight years off my training age, I guess, and hopefully still going up. So it'll be kind of cool to see. How is that measured? The well, I mean, one thing I, I can look at, you know, what I was doing when I was deadlifting. I mean, you know, okay. if I looked at if I can look at where I was deadlift wise last year, a um, 500 pound deadlift for about two reps would, would, would top me out. You know, the other day I did it for eight pretty easily, which is a significant, uh, you know, a significant jump, you know, and that's in a period of just a few months. And so I think that's pretty interesting. So when I looked at when I was deadlifting around 700 pounds, um, my 500 pound deadlift was, was, was about, it was about 10 reps. So I'm, I'm getting close to that again. And so I think if I decide to compete in the deadlift, you know, if I put on a, a belt, use deadlift shoes and put on a lifting suit, I think I'll pull 700 pounds again, which will put me, you know, it'll, it'll put me at the American record level, which will be pretty cool for, you know, you know, to be able to do that. So, well, um, a question I had from a friend of mine was, you know, what, what motivates you to want to set these goals and it sounds like you're constantly setting goals achieving them setting new goals and you know, why why what motivates you about setting those goals and why do you continue to do i'm just basically goals? i'm just basically crazy <laughs> no. i mean i don't know i mean it's it's it, you know you get to that and you kind of uh, you know you kind of uh it's kind of interesting i think most athletes especially you know high level athletes you know they get to the pinnacle of their sport 
<clears throat> and then they retire and then they kind of get depressed. I was never a, uh, you know, world champion athlete in the conventional sense, but I've done all these other sports that are considered, you know, maybe not as, as, as uh, prestigious, but at the same time, they're, they're, they're top level performance. And I just, I just keep finding new ones that I can do. And it's something that, that kind of motivates me and it keeps me from, I guess, being depressed, I would guess, you know, I think as long as I can, uh, <clears throat> continue, uh, um, you know, if I'm the badminton champion of the world at 90, I'll be happy. You know, it just, it doesn't matter. You know, as long as I, as long as I think I'm, uh, tangibly uh, achieving some sort of goal, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty happy that way. So describe going back to the zero carb diet. Describe a currently what what you how you sort of fine tune the diet and give us a snapshot of a typical day this week. Let's say, yeah. So fine tuning that's kind of funny. You know, I, I think that's one of the points of, of the zero carb diet. You know, if we go back to diet is tough because we make it hard. Um, if we assume that that animals know what to eat and they eat what they're supposed to eat, they don't worry about it. Right. If you look at a if you look at a giraffe, they're going to eat acacia leaves. If you look at a lion, they're going to eat zebra, gazelle, whatever they can catch. Humans, on the other hand, we can't we 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 don't know what the hell we're supposed to eat. We have you know 500 different diet plans, and there's macro counting, and there's uh, you know uh, you've got all these micronutrients you're worried about. When you go on a zero carb diet, you know it's crazy because if all you eat is meat, you're going to get all these nutrient deficiencies. You're gonna you're sure going to get sick. But what happened? But when that doesn't happen, and all you're doing is eating meat every day, you don't really have to think about it. And so, I mean, I have to, uh, as far as fine tuning, I don't do much. I just eat when I'm hungry, and that's you know. And what happened over time is, you know, your hunger kind of kind of dictates how much you need. So right now, currently, I'm probably around four to sometimes five pounds of meat a day. Generally, it, it, it turns out it's about two meals, sometimes three meals a day, but most of the time it's two meals a day. You know, there's some people that will, if they're obese, they may, they may skew towards a little bit leaner cuts of meat. You know, you can't go too lean, otherwise you'll have problems. Uh, there's something called rabbit starvation where, uh, you know, you can't survive on just lean meat. If you, would, if you had a 100% chicken breast diet, you would get sick, you know, so you have to have some fat in the diet. So I, I personally, you know, sort of gear towards ribeyes because they're, they're so damn good and then a lot of ground beef. Um, you know, I know that I'll sometimes eat when I'm not hungry, just because I know if I've got training ahead that I'll, I'll, uh, you know, I, I, I think that I do, I perform a little bit better with some food in my stomach, not, not directly before I work out, but you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to work out over lunch hour, I usually eat a breakfast. If I'm going to work out in the morning, I'll do it fasted and, and, you know, I think performance is not that much different, but I know because so often I'm trying to break a world record, I want to make sure that I kind of cover all my bases. You know, same thing with getting a good night's sleep the night before. You know, I, you know, I think that's you got to preference all you've got to sort of prioritize all these things, you know, for for, for top level performance. But, yeah, there, there are some people that, you know, that really they come from a ketogenic background and it really gets it's really tough for them to transition to a sort of a a zero carb mindset where it's just eat what you eat, eat as much as you want when you're hungry. And, you know, just like every other animal out in, in the world does. Uh, and, but, but they're like, well, what percentage fat should I eat? You know, and it's just like, eat, don't, you know, eat, eat regular meat, you know, what should I intermittent fast? No, you should eat when you're hungry. But what will happen is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people who get a lot of benefit out of intermittent fasting. And I, you know, certainly I did that, you know, before myself, you know, I would do, you know, eight sixteen or, you know, something like that. Um, but I found going zero carb that it, it just naturally occurs. And so what I'm seeing is if I get hungry at 14 hours, I'm not going to hold off for two hours just so I can say I intermittent fasting for 16 hours, because I think it's sensible to say you have hunger for a reason, you know, now, now many of it for most people it's dysregulated because we've got this horrible, uh, uh, food supply that everybody's eating garbage and they, they don't know what their hunger and signals are messed up. But for me at this point, I only eat one thing. I eat meat. And if I'm hungry, you know, it's probably time to eat. You know, I mean, there, you know, the animals, you know, animals, the lion's not going to sit there and lay around and say, oh, I'm not hungry enough yet. He's going to run out and go chase down on the zebra. You know, so I think we, an appetite is there for a reason. It's, it's just to, to make sure we get the nutrients we need when we need them. 
Oh, I love it. And uh, since I've recently moved to Ireland, um, my life's been a bit upside down and I'm kind of training irregularly and randomly, not very structured. Um, and it's this kind of like notion of simplicity, which I've stolen from you in terms of diet has really helped me out um, because, but it, but I still do have challenges. So for instance, this morning I had four lamb chops and I sure, thought I'm just sure. going to eat four lamb chops. <laughs> so I just put them in a pan with coconut oil and I looked in my fridge and I felt that I had this like uh, responsibility to uh, add more color to the plate, you know, p- put more vegetables in there for more, yeah, for more decoration. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For more. And yeah, I put these in quotes, nutrient density. Um, but then I've kind of thought about what you said. I thought, no, 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 you know, this should provide me everything I need. And so I cooked those four and I thought that'd be enough, but it wasn't. So I had two eggs. So I probably had about 13, 1400 calories. Uh, but that was, that was, at what uh 1 p.m so i'd fasted from like you know eight o'clock yesterday or whatever um and yeah like you say like the fasting just happens organically and it is right i mean i think you should you should i think you know i think we should think of it in terms of feasting you know you eat enough if you eat a big meal you know i deal with my kids because you know i've got four kids and they're always hungry so i i load them up with you know, meats and fats and stuff like that. So I don't have to deal with them for six or eight <laughs> hours. But I mean, you know, you, you've got to just, uh, you know, you, you know, if you, if you eat like that, you're going to find that most people, now there's some people that, that, that can't quite do it, but most people will fall into this, um, you know, twice a day routine. Uh, you know, if we look at autophagy where, you know, we think about the benefits of fasting in that regard, I think some of the data shows that about at six hours, that sort of sort of kicks in and peaks. And so, you know, I, well, I'm thinking I ate my last, I haven't eaten yet today just because it's, it's not convenient yet so far, but I had a meal last night at 7 p.m. So it's been, it's been 14 hours since I've had a meal. I'm not particularly hungry. So any, any benefits from fasting that would have occurred if I've been doing it intentionally are already occurring for me. So I think, like I said, and when I get really hungry, I'm going to eat. I'm not going to say I need to delay my fast another two hours just so I can hit some some sort of random uh, time goal. Now I don't. The other oh, thing sorry, you point go out. Oh, go, ahead. No, go on, Sean. Sorry. No, I was going to say this. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the other thing that I think is important point when you point out about nutrient density, because one of the big knocks that people have about somebody being on an all meat diet is you're going to be missing out on. You know, vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin K, vitamin E, potassium, calcium, uh, manganese, magnesium, all these things that supposedly I'm, I'm deficient in. Well, those deficiencies have consequences and those are apparent clinically. Now, now you know, if I were if I were to have a vitamin, vitamin C deficiency, which is a water soluble vitamin, Within about a month, I would start to develop, start to be developing scurvy, which you know is a problem, neurologic problems, you know problems with the, your, your gums bleeding, your teeth getting loose, you know uh, lethargy, things like that. I wouldn't be breaking world records with that. The same thing can be said with magnesium, manganese, calcium, all these other things that are essential for function. I am obviously getting enough. Now, the fact that the 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 uh, uh, the RDA says you need this much daily and i'm not getting that but yet i'm still performing well you have to reconcile that so there's a couple ways you do that one is you say that well how are those things determined in the first place and what was their purpose the purpose was to prevent uh population you know uh, problems not individual stuff you know they didn't look at carnivores they weren't studying eskimos and seeing what what their nutrient requirements are and we've got people that are getting all these fortified grains and the grains themselves have stuff that sort of bind up nutrients, and so you've got to, you know, if you assume everybody's eating 60% carbohydrates, where you're going to, you're going to, you're going to assume that, you know, a certain percentage of those nutrients aren't going to get absorbed, so you have to, you have to say, well, you need more to compensate for that. When you're not eating like that, and you're not eating anti-nutrients, and you're not eating a bunch of fiber, those requirements will likely go down. Also, biological processes that, that occur when you're using a lot of carbohydrates change the requirements for those things as well. And so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, because a, a lot of people will say, well, you're obviously going to be nutrient deficient. I'm saying, well, well, the proof's in the pudding. Show me how that, how that manifests itself. And, you know, there are people that have done this for 10, 20, even 50 years, and, and, you know, in modern times. And then if you go back into the historical populations, you know, we've got countless historical anecdotes of people doing, uh, living their whole life this way without, without nutrient deficiencies. 
So the short answer is you don't need to put a bunch of green stuff on your plate. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a unless you like them. It's a habit slash. I feel like I'm obliged to, but um, yeah, maybe. May- well, you've been guilt. You've probably been guilted in it by your by your mother, probably. You know, we all have. You know, eat your eat your greens, eat your vegetables is good for you. Well, you know, maybe 300 years ago it was cheap food, and that's why we wanted you to eat it because we didn't have enough meat for you. And so here's this stuff. There's, here's a, here's a bunch of green stuff we can get relatively cheaply. Uh, eat your food, no complaint. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I rarely see you eating eggs. Do you eat eggs? And do you see any downside in eating too many eggs? So. If you would have paid attention to my Twitter six months ago, you'd have seen me eating about 18 eggs a day. So I've eaten a lot of eggs. Um, once I went on this all meat diet, my desire to eat eggs kind of went down significantly. I still like them and I eat them occasionally, but I will tell you when I compare a ribeye steak, you know, to a plate of eggs, a ribeye steak is going to, I'm going to pick that every time. Now I'll eat probably, oh, if I had to average it out, maybe, maybe two or three eggs a week which is probably kind of a normal intake for most people. But for me, that's way down because I used to eat, God, 12 a day easily and sometimes 18 a day. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I think they're fine. They're, they're very, they're very uh, nutrient dense, if we want to use that term. They're, they're great food. Um, I think they're a good complement to, to an all meat diet. But I think most people that do this will find that, you know, meat is a food and everything else is kind of the accoutrement. You know, if you want to add some eggs, yeah, if you want to put a little cheese on there, yeah, that's fine. If you want to, you know, even things like bacon, you know, you can do that, uh, seafood, same thing. But I think the main basis of the diet tends to be uh, some sort of red meat, whether it's lamb or, uh, you know, lamb is not big in the U.S., but certainly when I lived in New Zealand, it was it was obviously huge. And then I'm sure in Ireland and, and, and it, the rest of the U.K., it's, uh, uh, you know, or in the U.K., it's, it's, it's popular as well. But, but I tend to eat mostly beef. How do you do? You do any sort of seasoning at all? Do you do anything that you do to make the the red meat more sort of flavorsome? Uh, I used to do some different seasonings. I would use like garlic butter, but now it's basically just salt, you know. And it's kind of funny because the farther I get, the the the, the less I feel I need that extra stuff. The other, the meat just tastes so good by itself that I almost don't even need that. But I mean, I I, I do I do like salt. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think there's some benefits to it. I think the, the, I think there's a, there's a, uh, we've had, we've kind of demonized salt for a long time. And I think just like a lot of the other dietary advice we've had, uh, a lot of those things aren't panning out to be what we thought they are. So I, 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 like I said, salt's fine. A little bit of pepper. Uh, there's some people that, that don't avoid all spices. I don't think you necessarily have to do that. I think you can tolerate that. I think, you know, plants, it could be used medicinally. They can be used as spices. You know, if you, if, if you tolerate them, fine. That's fine. There's a lot of people that don't. And I, I find for me that I just run better without them. You know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to fathom to say that if you don't eat vegetables, you're going to be somehow feel better, but that's been the case. And so all I can do is say, this is my observation. And so now you have to go back and say, well, why is that? And then you can test that. And so we've just kind of assumed that, Fruits and vegetables are, are perfect and benign, and they don't bother anyone, and everybody needs to eat them, except that when you stop eating them, you feel better. And then you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. And so that's where I'm at now, trying to figure this stuff out. Because if, if, if I felt that, hang on, if I felt that uh, my athletic performance or my health got a lot better if I started eating broccoli, then, then I would do that. Okay, so I wondered, uh, well, this is actually a question from Mike Williams. He asks, have you had experienced any downside to zero-carb diet? Anything downside or anything you're experiencing differently that might not be a positive outcome? You know, when, when, you, when I first sort of adapted to it, and I'd gone through keto adaptation with the keto flu and all that stuff, I had a similar experience. You know, I, I saw that, uh, you know, I, for me, it kind of manifests itself as headaches, and so I had some kind of a low grade mild headache for about the first two weeks. Um, my athletic performance was probably a little less for the first month, I'd say, you know, then I kind of, uh, kind of, you know, started getting better and better. Um, you know, there are, 
you know, convenience issue sometimes, you know, you, you know, it's, uh, if you're, if you're out socially and there's, there's nothing you want, you can eat, you know, you gotta either sit there and eat all the meat <laughs> on the tray and, and, and kind of get embarrassed by that. But, uh, um, I don't think I've had any physical downsides other than, 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 than adapting to it. Um, you know, it can be expensive, you know, depending on, uh, how you decide to eat. If you decide you want to eat all, you know, in the U S grass fed, uh, beef is much more expensive than perhaps in the UK where everything is, I think everything's right. Grass fed, if I'm not mistaken, uh, unless it's imported. But, uh, so there, there is an expense issue. Although I, I, I you know, and, and it's controversial for a lot of people. I don't see the health benefits of the grass fed meat to be, hugely significant in comparison to the price and so i'll eat a lot of that what we would call conventional meat over here just to just to offset the price because even even me with a relatively decent income eating five pounds of meat a day at twenty dollars a pound grass-fed is, is is cost prohibitive and so i don't think uh it's fair for me to promote a diet and say well it's just a great diet but you got to spend a hundred dollars you know, or, or eighty dollars a day to, to to do it because no one no one can do that. I mean, it's it's, it's unrealistic. And so, uh, so I've been doing some experiment. You know, I've been going to these little fast food restaurants and ordering these bunless burgers and trying that out, and you know, and finding you can do it fairly, you know, fairly cheaply, at least here. Now that's interesting. Um, so what? Uh, yeah, because I've seen I've seen you you post the pictures of the the Wendy's diet <laughs> with all of the. Well, I'd say, you know, I'm, I, you know, it's like I said, I'm, I'm just on the road and try, testing some things out. You know, it's just, it's more just kind of personal research. I, I don't know that, uh, um, it's something that I would do full time just because I think some, some of the other stuff tastes better. But, uh, you know, if I were, uh, you know, if I were a struggling, you know, mom of three kids, single family had a very low income, you know, you could do that. I mean, you really could, you know, it's, it's, you know, rather than trying to pay for all this organic fruit and vegetables, uh, you know, you could much more cheaply get a greater amount of nutrition. I think that way and it's, 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 it's controversial. It'll piss a lot of people off to say that, uh, you know, because the fast food companies have been demonized for good reason. I mean, the rest of their food's crap. I mean, all the, 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 the all the rest of the stuff they, they have on the menu is just garbage for you. And I think it's, it's, uh, uh, in general bad and then they've marketed that stuff to kids and, and i think that's a shame but they do have they do have you know 100 percent beef on their menu and i think that that can actually be a health food and i think if you went in there and, and just ordered it that way you could actually do do a pretty decent job um I, every time i go into a fast food restaurant i mean i see all kinds of obese people but they're all drinking cokes and eating french fries you know it's it's they're not sitting there eating bunless burgers like me when i order that the you know the cash register person looks at me like I'm crazy because I never see that. And I think that's, that's a pretty powerful anecdote. You know, it's, it's, it's not the meat, it's the rest of the crap. Do you ever eat any junk, any sugar whatsoever? Uh, not in, uh, I haven't had that in, uh, God, before that, when I was on a ketogenic diet, I would make some ketogenic desserts. You know, I would do these little, you know, keto fat bomb cheesecake, things like that, which I would, you know, whether you want to call that junk or not, uh, but but since I've gone zero carb, you know, at least since December, I haven't had any of that stuff. You know, I'll make some stuff for my kids, you know, but I don't eat it. You know, it's, uh, you know, my kids, I have, I try to keep my feed my kids on a, you know, basically a high animal protein diet with, with, you know, with fruits and stuff like that. A little bit of occasionally vegetables. They don't really like them, so I don't force it on them. Uh, I'll make some, I'll make some desserts for them out of stevia and heavy cream and stuff like that. But no, I really haven't had that stuff. Um, and I really haven't had a great desire for it, which is the other weird thing, because, you know, you would think, well, how do you how do you not get bored eating what you're eating? And, and it's kind of interesting. It's just, it just kind of turns off those cravings for the most part. You know, it's more physiologically, it's pretty easy. Psychologically, sometimes it gets a little tough because you're, you know, you see the stuff, and you're like, well, I might try that. But I, I mean, it's pretty easy to, to, uh, uh, you know, like I said, I'm so performance based, you know, that's, that's it's for me eating, uh, eating a, uh, keto brownie is going to, is in my mind, and maybe I'm crazy, but in my mind, it, it's going to translate into a, a decreased performance over the next coming days. And I don't want to, I don't want to waste that time. So I'm more interested in let's, how do I keep, you know, 
pushing this world record down lower and lower. And what's going to what's going to be a net positive? What's going to be a net negative? Same thing with alcohol. You know, I have a French girlfriend who she likes to drink wine, and you know, she, I will say that occasionally I have a glass of wine with her, or part, or maybe a half a glass of wine. And I know it's going to interrupt my sleep a little bit. I know it's going to it's going to decrease my performance a little bit. But I do make that probably that's probably the only exception I'll make right now. Fair enough. Um, you mentioned on email you've got an upcoming book, which surprised me. So can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so I was approached by uh, about four months ago by another sort of long-term zero-carb guy. Uh, his name is Saif Amus. He's from, uh, he's, he's from Beirut. He's a, a professor of economics, and he's been doing this for a long time. And asked me if I'd be interested in sort of co-authoring a book with him. And I said, you know, let me think about it. And I thought, well, yeah, this, that would be interesting to do. And so the more I've gotten into it, the more sort of material, we, 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 you know, I've sort of thought about putting into that. And so, yeah, it's something we're going to we're in we're in the middle of, of writing um, probably by the fall. Hopefully we'll have a have a kind of a finalized copy and, and put it out there. Uh, the problem is there's not a lot of there's a lot of, there's a few resources for the zero carb folks. And there, there seems to be more and more people that are willing to at least consider it as an option. You know, funny six months ago, you know, and, and, and a lot of people still think it's crazy, but there's, there's more and more people that seem to, to start saying low carb keto, zero carb slash zero carb as it's an actual thing. And so I think there's, a, there's more and more people that are, that are finding that, that this may be a viable option. You know, you're not seeing all these people, you know, laying in the ground in pools of blood with their teeth falling out from scurvy. So maybe this is a viable option and maybe humans are carnivores. You know, maybe we optimally are suited as carnivores. I don't know. I mean, the, the assumption is that we're omnivores because everybody we've seen for the last 500 years has had, has, has had an omnivorous diet. You know, that really goes back about 10,000 years. Once you go back before that, and if we assume that the, uh, the, the homo genus has been around, you know, 2.8 2. to 3 million years. Um, so at some point during that time, there's probably at least periods of popul- periods and groups of population that ate either a purely carnivorous diet or as close to that as possible. And, you know, were they thriving? Do they have optimal health at, at, at that time? I don't know. You know, obviously they're living in a tough time where they're fighting animals and they're prone to injuries and their life spans as long. But what happens when humans in 2017 eat that? Does their health get better? Does it get worse? Is it optimal? You know, I've seen a lot of examples of people that, that will tell you that their health is optimal on a zero carb diet. So you have to you have to take that observation and say, well, either they're lying, they're genetically predisposed to that, or maybe there is something to that. And maybe we do function best as a carnivore. It's an interesting theory, but we'll see. You know, maybe we can test it somehow. Yeah, sounds exciting, and uh, we'll look out for the book once it's out. Um, you'll have to email me so we can we can we can we can push sure. it. Um, so we've got to we've got to we've got to wrap up. So we're definitely going to have to do a part two, Sean, and it's going to have to be a long one because there's so much stuff I didn't get to ask you. Um, so note for next time. Let's let's make sure we do a, a longer one. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, one last it. question I wanted to ask you is. What final ask or piece of advice would you like to leave the listeners with in terms of, you know, how how you think they should look at their long term health and fitness? Well, I think you I think you should not be afraid to experiment. I, I think we have I'm a physician and I will tell you, I think the medical profession has largely failed our population as far as longevity and health. I and mean, we, we have we've been an abysmal failure. We've done a lot of good, and there's a lot of things we've done that help people. But I think you've got to just sort of say, you know, you can't just leave it to your doctor to take care of your health. You've got to go out there and experiment and see what works for you. Uh, you can do your own N equals one experiment. I think hopefully we'll be able to, to consolidate some of that stuff and get some information. There's a lot of conflict of interest and bias out there producing some of the science right now, and so and it changes all the time. And so I think you have to. Find what matters to you. I mean, it's not it's not a blood test. I'll tell you that. You know, if, if you're if you're defining your health based on your total cholesterol, you've got your you're you're going to be in for a rude awakening. I think so. You have to find out the metrics that, that truly matter to you and, and really define health. A lot of physicians can't even define health. 
you know, they, they define health as a, as a set of lab values. And I think that's a wrong approach. And we've gotten to where we, we've kind of just lost the forest for the trees. We look, you know, we look at these little tiny, tiny things and we think we know everything. And then we find out five years later that, oh, wait, we didn't have it right. But those thousands of patients we told to do something are now worse off than where they were before. I think you have to, you know, I think you have to, well, I mean, I think that basically I think you need to stay, you need to stay. You need to maintain muscle mass. You need to stay strong. You need to be able to move. Uh, you need to stay lean. You know, I think those things are all components of health. And I think if you uh, don't do that, you're going to you're going to age poorly. And that's good advice. So for everyone listening to get the the show notes and links and resources um stuff that we we mentioned today and please head on over to 15 minute corporate warrior.com forward slash podcast and on there you'll see this episode and links to all the other podcasts we've done and um, also please take a moment to subscribe on whatever platform is your platform of choice whether that be overcast or stitcher or itunes if you subscribe you automatically download the podcast as it goes live um which would really help me as well um so that's it sean thank you for taking the time today i appreciate it it's uh, really good to finally talk um and yeah let's uh i'll reach out to you and let's get a let's get a part two in the diary sounds good thank you very much Lawrence. have a nice evening out there <laughs> i will okay. take care sean all the best catch you later okay. bye okay. bye bye I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, remember to get your free ebook with six interview transcripts with some of my top guests, including Skylar Tanner, Dr. Doug McGuff, and Bill De Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health. These transcripts are not verbatim. Instead, they have been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to pick out what you need fast and get results. To get your ebook, head on over to 15minutecorporatewarrior.com forward slash ebook and enter your email address for instant access.